I'd firstly like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people, the traditional owners of this land, um, the land that we gather on here today, and pay respect to their elders, both past and present. And then I'd like to welcome all of you on this early Sunday morning, and thank you all for coming, bright and early, and for rocking up for what looks like another fantastic day. And I hope you're not completely overloaded by the intellectual stimulation and the motivation from yesterday's lectures. So I'm Eugenie Kayak, and I'm an anaesthetist based in Melbourne, and I'm also the Victorian Chair of DEA. And I'm doing the introduction this morning, and I've been asked actually to speak a little bit about DEA as an organisation, um, just to give those who are not intricately familiar with us an idea of what we're about and what we do, and encourage you to get more involved. So our... Um, Vision is healthy planet, healthy people, and I actually think that pretty much sums us up, as does our vision statement, protecting health through care of the environment. And I always look at that and think, right, well, I could just stop here, couldn't I? Because that's, that tells you what we do. But it's a bit more complicated than that, and DEA was formed in 2001, um, and Grant Blaschke, who was here yesterday, was one of the founding members, as was Bill Castleton and David Shearman, who's still our secretary, but unfortunately not with us here because he had an accident a week ago, but he is recovering. And I think they knew then, back in 2001, that we all know now today and appreciate, and that is that as a modern society, I think we tend to forget or just conveniently ignore the fact that human health really is dependent on stable, healthy, productive, natural environments. It might seem pretty obvious, but we need healthy ecosystems, and that was mentioned several times yesterday, to really support us as healthy human beings. And guess what? We only have one world. And we know that, but it is a finite world, and it does have finite resources to support us and also to deal with our waste streams. And I think, as a global community, we tend to forget that, and we're acting as if we have more than one world at the moment. In fact, at the moment, we're using resources and producing waste as if we've got one and a half planets. And by 2020, as business, um, just business as usual scenario, we'll need two planets to support us. Now, obviously, that's not sustainable, and we need to look after our natural environment as it's our life support system. And I think we all appreciate that humans are affecting the environment in numerous ways, but probably none is more significant to our health and what's happening to our future than how we're changing the composition of our atmosphere. So we're having accelerated climate change, which we know, and enhanced global warming, and that, as we know, also has significant health implications. So, global warming, good mos for mosquitoes, bad for your health. And I put this up here, and I know it's been mentioned, but this was actually a poster produced with the AMA and DEA back in 2006. And I just wanted to emphasise that, that we've been working on this issue, and I would say that we've been the leading medical voice on this issue for a long time. The AMA, to their credit, have been very supportive, but I don't know that they've necessarily gone out there and been a really vocal voice on what climate change is doing to health. And I wasn't involved in DA in 2006, but I'm really proud that DA had the foresight back then to produce this poster. And we're not alone, of course, and you know that. The Lancet, WHO, United Nations, they've all come out and said that climate change is the, potentially the biggest global health threat of this century. And that's why DA has been so vocal, working on trying to raise awareness of the situation. And obviously it is a health threat. Um, the United Nations have said that climate change is the existential threat of this century. It affects all our development goals, because if you really think about it deeply, it's not just health and productivity, but so many of the Millennium Development Goals will be affected by accelerated climate change. And we talk about it a lot, and we are experiencing extreme weather events here, and as Linda mentioned, globally. And it's really important to be able to manage the unavoidable. Um, but what we have to do, and what we can still do this decade, is avoid the unmanageable. And I think that's a quote from Tony McMichael. It wasn't from me to begin with. So we have to avoid the unmanageable, and it's not too late. 
and hasn't been talked about specifically yet, but I think DEA should be really proud, and you as members, that we have really been a leading voice talking about something that's big, and it's brown, and it's dirty, and it's bad for us, and it's a four-letter word, and it's a health hazard, and it's coal. And I say this here now because it's been such a big part of what DEA does, and I think that often members can't really appreciate, or it's really hard to actually think, gosh, coal, you know, it's black, it's brown, it's dirty, and I'm not really that interested in it. But the Australian coal industry is accountable for over a third of our greenhouse gas emissions, and that doesn't include export emissions. And globally, the coal industry is accountable for over a third of greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a major factor, and we need to address coal if we're going to address climate change. And also, it causes local pollution, and every major systemic or system in our body is, can be adversely affected by local air pollution from coal emissions. So that's why I think and we think that coal or maybe the greatest co-benefit for global and national health would be a reduction in the mining of coal and its use for power generation. And I must say I can't wait until the AMA and other organisations also come out and make statements like that. So we've been pretty active, we're as active as we can for a predominantly voluntary organisation and I think this is probably a paper that we should be proud of because it's a peer-reviewed paper that was in the MJA in 2011, The Mining and Burning of Coal, written by um, four DEA members. We produced this poster several years ago. David King, I don't know if he's here, hand up. No, not here yet. Um, DEA used to produce a poster once a year, and this is the last one we produced, um, just emphasising the health risks of coal. We've also presented at countless forums I've only got photos of the Victorian one here, but this is back in 2010 when we um, presented at the Victorian Parliament. Joe McCubbin, um, Marion Carey is here, and Grant Blaschke um, was here yesterday. Um, but not only, obviously, here in Victoria, but I'd just like to make a little mention of what they've been doing in South Australia. Is Ingo here? I was going to be caught out for not being here early. Um, in South Australia, they haven't only presented once, but they've presented twice or three times to the Vic um, South Australian Parliament. Are there any of the South Australian students here that have done that? Not yet. Okay. So Port Augusta, which is in South Australia, is one of the most polluting um, power plants in Australia. And there's big um, community push to try and repower Port Augusta with clean energy. And DEA have been integral in helping that um, campaign, working closely with Mark Ogue and when he worked with BZE and AYCC and really emphasising the health risks of the coal polluting power plant compared to their alternative that they're looking at, which is a concentrated solar thermal plant. Um, they haven't necessarily won yet, but it's still a campaign that's going, and they've had the support of the colleges of the GP, physicians, the AMA, and the Nursing and Midwives Federation of Australia, which is really quite significant. And at the moment, there's a million-dollar feasibility study supported by ARENA and Atlinta, Atlinta, the Power Corporation. So it is still something that is continuing. Um, so I think they are to be congratulated for that. Um, and I'm sorry they're not here. Um, so I'll have to just mention VCAT in Victoria. And I know lots of you have probably heard about this, but I think it's something that we just need to emphasise what DEA does. We work on so many levels. Um, but in 2011, DEA legally opposed the EPA approval of a new um, coal-fired power plant in the Latrobe Valley um, this was a significant undertaking for a voluntary organisation. It was the biggest court case that VCAT's ever heard. And we weren't obviously the only party. Environment Victoria put together a very big um, um, campaign and also um, what's the word? Um, a legal team to take to VCAT, as did um, Martin Shields, an individual, represented himself and Liv, another community group. And there was great campaigning by Stop HRL and Friends of the Earth. But anyway, it's significant um, because I think it's the first time our lawyers said that a health organisation 
has actually opposed the new coal-fired power station in, in Australia, if not globally, on health grounds. So it was on local and global health grounds. Did we win? Well, no and yes, <laughs> in that order. Um, no, we didn't win. VCAT did approve the coal-fired power plant, but they put exceptionally stringent conditions on it going ahead. Conditions that would protect the local health of residents, more well residents, I must say. I should have described this um, picture here, but that green spot is where the power plant was going to go, and that bunch of houses there, that's more well. And that mine that you see on the corner there is the Hazelwood coal mine that happens to have been burning for the last few weeks. So significant because the one, the blue is one kilometres and the two is, and the red is two kilometres. And in, in Victoria, it's almost impossible to build a wind farm within two kilometres of a residential um, site at present. Anyway, so VCAT did approve the power plant, but they put stringent conditions on it, and basically it meant that the company in the end pulled out further development. So no, it is not going ahead. So ultimately, it was a win. You just have to be persistent, and sometimes it's months later. So how do we work? Well, we meet face-to-face -face with policymakers. We meet numerous politicians every year, and we write literally hundreds of letters to them. We support communities around the country to protect health from pollution, and particularly our new liaison officer, Maren Redenbach, is doing an amazing job there. We encourage medical professionals and students to become advocates. And we participate in hundreds of forums, evidence at parliamentary inquiries. We have this amazing national conference, which is expanding. Can I just say, in 2009, I think there were a dozen or two dozen people at the initial first conference. And obviously, there are numerous other activities. We have a national management committee, which is all voluntary. They give their voluntary time and resources to make this organisation work, um, chaired by Kingsley Faulkner. And obviously, there's the never-stopping David Shearman, even when he does have accidents. <laughs> um, we have several co-opted members, and we're supported by an amazing scientific advisory committee. And I'd like to thank one of our next speakers, who's added her name to that, Fiona Stanley. And I don't know if, um, thank you, Bob Douglas is here. He was here yesterday. Is he here? Thank you. There's Bob as well. But I won't read them all out because there's just too many professors and AOs and AMs and I'll get them all muddled up. And we have employees now. So four years ago, we didn't have employees. So we're expanding. Our numbers have more than doubled in five years and it's a really exciting time to be part of this organisation. We have Joy Oddie and I think she's probably out the back. But she's our administrative officer and we wouldn't be able to do what we could without her. And Maren Redenbeck is there. Stand up, <laughs> quick. Our research and liaison officer, who is a, um, a medical doctor, um, paediatrician to be, and has just been amazing and given a lot of her voluntary time as well. And at the moment, we've applied or advertised for a communications media officer. And I think maybe a reflection of our standing is that the applications so far are absolutely <coughs> phenomenal. It's going to be hard. Anyway, obviously the management committee doesn't do everything. We're supported by subcommittees now, which is a relatively new phenomenon for DEA. And we have state committees, student committees, climate change committees, and a whole lot more. And particularly if anyone here is interested in the climate change committee, um, I encourage you to um, come and talk to one of us, particularly Catherine Pendry. We also have a working group on our governance structure because we're expanding and we need to look at our governance issues and our reform. And that's a bit of a hassle, but I think it's a compliment in a sense because it shows that we need to get our systems right and make sure we've got good building blocks to expand on. Part of all this has been also the updating and new logo for DEA. And I'm not sure if Dimity Williams is here yet. I'm picking everyone else to make sure they get here early. Anyway, Dimity has been working exceptionally hard with Joy and Anne, and we have a new logo, which is a bit cleaner and moderner. Still has the cross to um, mention medical um, and the horizon to, to um, mention the sort of the curves of the environment. And I won't go through all of this because I already have. We do fun things too. Um, we have bike rides and journal clubs and dinners. Um, and never doubt that a group of thoughtful, committed, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Now, obviously, with all this work 
and expansion. We also need to raise funds, and that's never fun, is it? Except there is a fun way that we're going to raise funds this year, a fun and healthy way. And I just would like you all to look at this and pay attention and write it down and join us. <laughs> So we're going to participate in the Melbourne Marathon, but you don't have to run a marathon. And student DEA members who join up, if you get four times the um, cost of the registration raised, by the end of early bird, we will pay your registration. And everyone else, we encourage you. You don't have to be a DEA member to join and run for us, and you definitely don't have to be a DEA member to support a runner. We really want to make this big and it will be fun and please get behind it. Um, there's going to be a clipboard going around looking for email addresses. Laura, is Laura here? Laura's been doing all the work on this. I don't know if she's here. But thank you. And at the moment you can register but the GoFundRaising site won't be up and going for a week so you can't get people to sponsor you yet. But I'm going to do the half marathon and if a um, middle-aged mother like me can do that, I get to, I think you can all get up and run for us. It'll be great. Thank you. And if I could just get all the management committee members just to stand up briefly and, are they here? <coughs> and wave. There's a few of them here. Okay. We'll just leave it there. Thank you. Oh, oh my gosh. I knew I'd forget this. Sorry. One other thing. With the new logo, um, and I'm sorry, Alice, where are you? Oh, with the new logo, um, we are also redesigning our T-shirt. This is the, not the new one, this is the last one that I have on anyway. Alice is up there, okay, and we need to email T-shirt designs with the new logo to Alice. And her email address is alice.mcgushin at utas.edu.au. And there'll be more to come about that later. Is that okay, Alice? Thank you. Sorry.